Good morning. How are we doing on audibility? Can you hear me in the back? I see from the blank stares, the answer is probably no. Uh, good morning, folks. Can you hear me in the back? Excellent, excellent. Uh, I'm Ed Wasserman. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here. Um, and welcome, welcome to Berkeley. Now, uh, I, I feel that some of you aren't very familiar with Berkeley, and part of my job is to orient you. Uh, so be advised that Berkeley is a nuclear-free zone. So I hope none of you uh, tried to get your fast fusion reactors in with you to come to the conference. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the significance of the nuclear free zone is, but I know that I live just over the city line in Kensington, and I know when I cross that line, there's a sense of foreboding that, I, that steals over me. So I always feel much safer once I'm back in Berkeley. You should also be advised that the customs and culture of the place are a little bit different. Uh, you'll see various uh, gray-haired people uh, stumbling along the street. They may be recently uh, deinstitutionalized, but they may be Nobel Prize winners, or they may be, and they may be both. So you want to be careful. You want to be especially careful because uh, one of the things you have to do when you move to Berkeley is unlearn the very first thing that your mother told you, which is to look both ways before you cross the street. <laughs> People in Berkeley believe uh, that they are constitutionally entitled to walk into traffic. They also believe that a protective dome descends on them once they do that, and cars were, are unable to hit them. So watch it, and watch out for the bicyclists too. They're even more, um, even more convinced of their invulnerability. Uh, anyway, I was asked to say little and say it quickly, uh, so I will. Um, but I did want to, um, I did want to say something. I, Lowell is going to have some uh, generous comments about our donors. I wanted to make some generous comments about Lowell. I've been coming to this symposium for about eight years now. I've been to all but one. I was on sabbatical that year in, in South America. Uh, and I've never heard anybody say anything particularly nice about Lowell. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's time. In which we'll probably continue. No, I, I'm going to break with that tradition because I, you know Lowell as a, uh, as a superb journalist. You know him as a journalist in print and in documentary. I know him as an educator. So I want to just pull back the curtain for a moment and talk about Lowell Bergman's contribution to higher ed in journalism. He, at the investigative reporting program, has largely pioneered a style of reporting, a style of instructing uh, students in reporting in which they work closely as a master-apprentice style of, uh, of education. It's highly experiential in orientation. We try to get students uh, uh, to do the most difficult, the most demanding journalism they can while they're students here. And he's had remarkable success. There's, there's a, virtually a generation of reporters that have had their tickets stamped at the investigative reporting program, thanks to Lowell. Just past the past few few months we've had our reporters with work they're doing here in graduate school and it, at the uh, uh, PBS NewsHour, uh, Bill Moyers program, NBC Nightly News. This is, this is the kind of work that we're expecting of students here and the kind of work that Lowell has, uh, to his very great credit, pioneered and it's a model, they call it a teaching hospital model, they call it experiential learning, but it's a model that very much developed and, and, and road tested and now is routinely used here. And I think Lowell deserves credit for that uh, in a way that he has not received. And I'm here to tell you that I just want to put that out there. Now, <laughs> and that, that enables me to segue into my final re remark, which has to do with the perhaps surprising news that this is an, an educational institution. Um, and I say surprising because we pay so much attention to the journalism that comes out of this place, we forget the fact that we're teaching here. Um, and the reason this matters is because there are a lot of donors in the room, and so I, I, I would like you to hear this, that your enthusiasm, the philanthropic response to the funding crisis in journalism, which has been tremendous, and shows great vision, shows great imagination, shows great commitment. The response to the funding problem of journalism in no way has been matched by a corresponding response to the funding crisis in journalism education. 
The University of California is embarked in an experiment to find out whether public higher education can survive without public funding. UC Berkeley used to get, maybe a decade ago, don't you can fact check these numbers, somewhere around 40% of this money from the state of California. It's down around 14% now. So we uh, are in a bit of a pickle. And, and to some degree, the, uh, and so w w what do I do as dean? I spend a lot of time trying to create revenue uh, opportunities. I spend a lot of time to trying to raise money. And generally speaking, the kind of money that's available is money that's tied to particularly glamorous, interesting, high-impact journalism projects, not to the fact that we need to prepare and train another generation of journalists. Now, my generation of journalists is full of it. You, you get a lot of disparaging remarks about how unnecessary journalism education is. You hear people say, oh, well, I had my degree in botany. And then I started in the newsroom emptying ink wells and changing the typewriter ribbon, and somehow I made it to the New York Times, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that that world, if it ever existed, doesn't exist anymore. The hires out there, the opportunities out there are for people, for young people with a lot of, with a lot of uh, energy and a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of skill. They're supposed to be bristling with skills. They should know how to tell stories with words, with pictures, with pictures and sound, with informational graphics and the rest. That's the kind of opportunity that's available. You don't learn that on the job because you know what? Journalism organizations don't want to teach anymore. They want the people walking in the door camera ready. So I leave you with that. Uh, you people are, there's a room full of supporters. There's a room full of simpaticos. I'm very, very happy to see you and, and glad for the opportunity to speak one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so I, with that, I will leave you with uh, my, my friend and mentor, Lowell Bergman. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> I did ask him for a raise, by the way. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the ninth annual Logan Symposium in Investigative Reporting. In addition to turning off your cell phones, I would like to remind you also that this is being recorded on video and audio. And we intend to post it, the proceedings on our website and on Fora TV. In a little bit, I'll be explaining why that could have real consequences for anyone who speaks their mind here today, including me. But before I get to that, and, and by the way, before I go on, what I mean by that is you'll hear an explanation of litigation that took place as a result of the last gathering here. Before I get to that, let me formally thank the wide variety of people who managed to get here from all over the globe. And in particular, that, that uh, we were talking about, Ed was talking about education, that one of the ways that we tried to uh, make journalism education educational uh, is that we invite people to our classes and we try to get involved with students involved with all kinds of reporters and editors, prosecutors and defense attorneys, intelligence agents, private investigators, Hollywood executives, screenwriters, philanthropists, financiers, and so forth. And that represents basically the cross-section of you that we brought here today because it's, we think, the kind of mix of people that you need to know in journalism, and they need to know you. So you, I think, we hope one of the things that you'll do here is not only enjoy yourself and actually have good food at a journalism gathering, but also that you'll be able to network and possibly develop sources, or if you're a source, that you'll be able to meet somebody who you could trust and develop a relationship. I can't go any further without asking um, the people responsible for create the family responsible, thanking the family responsible for creating this program, the Logan family, David and Reva Logan, who are, have passed away. But mo I, I always remember uh, David looking at me, and I said to him, so what do you want me to do? He said, make trouble. But I also want to thank their sons, and I wish they would stand. Richard and John, please stand. And their brother Daniel it couldn't be here today. Yeah. 
And in the course of, because of their seed financing, we've been able over the last decade or more to attract financing so that we have a wide variety of funders, so that we're not dependent on any particular funder in case they dislike what we do, which is generally somebody has to dislike what we do, and, um, and that we have a degree of independence. And then all of this couldn't have been possible and, and all the things that had to, uh, to be done to bring you together without the work of our managing director, Janice Huey, who is sitting down here. Janice, you don't want to stand? And, and her indomitable sidekick, get Gemma Givens. Where is Gemma? Oh, there she is. Okay. And, and Janice wanted to make sure that for, for almost all of our, I believe all of our proceedings, uh, the reason you can hear everything is because we have Alan Brett sitting there uh, doing the sound. As a, as, as uh, people, younger people who are with me on, on the road when we go and do an interview or any interview, I always uh, point out that the sound man is always much more important than the cameraman. Of course, the cameraman you know, starts to get anxious. And the reason is, if you got bad sound, you can't fix it. Uh, and one of the basic lessons I learned going from print to TV. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, many of you, the panelists, there's Brian Joseph. Where are you, Brian? Brian Joseph over here, who is part of what makes this conference a little bit different in that the, he interviewed every one of the panelists, prepares dossiers, uh, briefs, then we brief the moderators. And that's because, as I was explaining to somebody a little bit earlier, that we like the panel, panels and the panelists really to be not just entertaining but informative, and that we, we don't want people just to drone on or we don't want people to like get out of control. So with so Brian does the pre-screening. Um, and so over the last year since we last gathered, um, we've continued with our obsession with collaboration by attracting new partners. And in the last year, one of those partners was the Norfolk Virginian Pilot and NBC News. And this was really exactly what Ed was trying to say that we do. They partnered with, in a multi-platform investigation with one of our graduate students, Jason Palladino, and with the pilots, Mike Hixenbaugh and NBC News' investigative producer, Anna Schechter, who's here, over here. And they produced the first installment of the story of the Navy's most dangerous aircraft. It may be the military's most dangerous aircraft, the Sea Dragon. Its mechanical failures have killed 30 airmen. The 29-year-old lieutenant was a highly regarded naval aviator, pilot of an MH-53E Sea Dragon, the Navy's largest, oldest, and most dangerous helicopter. And we see this particular strand of reporting, which we'd never gotten into before, into the Pentagon and what's actually going on inside the Pentagon is something that we will begin to make into a permanent part of the, uh, of the investigative reporting program's work in the year to come. Another area reporting for us this last year that's new is we brought, a, as a postgraduate fellow, a former uh, panelist, Annabel Hernandez from Mexico. You may, rem if you remember Annabel, she couldn't go anywhere in Mexico without bodyguards, so we figured Berkeley would be a free zone. It may be nuclear free, and it appears to be gunman free. And uh, she has been working with our Univision IRP fellow, uh, fellow, Steve Fisher, and they've been stirring things up in Mexico from here traveling back and forth, in investigating the disappearance of the 43 students in Guerrero. And this could lead still to another project that we had a meeting, a long-term project, reporting on Mexico. It's always surprised me that despite the fact that Mexico is on our border, all we ever hear about is drug trafficking or immigration, and there is so much going on there. And as people who live there will tell you, it's never been closer to crisis. And then the other thing that's happening, some of you were here last night, know that we are continuing our collaboration with Univision and Frontline, KQED Radio, and the Center for Investigative Reporting in the sequel to Rape in the Fields, which will be an investigation of janitorial workers and what happens after you leave your work at night. Uh, we hope that that will air on 
uh, June 23rd. Place of work, by the way, and you'll also see your big box store and the, the movie theater you go to. Now, many things have changed over the last year here at the IRP and in journalism, but one thing in this country hasn't, and that's the effort by those, of, those people in positions of power to intimidate the press, to stop us from covering stories in the public interest. Last year, we had Jim Risen here, and as you know, we've had special events with Jim while he was fighting the subpoena that came from the Obama administration to testify in a criminal case in Washington involving, they wanted him to identify his source. In the end, it turns out Jim did not have to go to jail. He's back reporting for the New York Times. But while he's free to walk around, his source isn't. He's currently still out of jail, but has been convicted without Jim's testimony and is now facing imprisonment. As it turned out, ironically, they never needed Jim's testimony. They were able to get a conviction without him. What they did, and remember the panel yesterday, or if you're, the, you're students from the seminar, you remember what we talk about. All they had to do in class, all they had to do was get his Jim's phone records and email traffic, and they, and they could convict him. Remember that lesson. It's an object lesson, and it's part, but it doesn't end there with what the administration did. While Eric Holder says that he has sympathy for reporters, and it, and it turned out he didn't need Jim to testify, nevertheless, in the course of the proceedings, he chose to take a, a decision by the trial judge in favor of Jim's right not to identify his sources and appeal it to the Federal Court of Appeals in that district. And the result was an affirmation that we as reporters do not have a right to protect the identity of our sources in a, crim in a federal criminal case. So whatever happened in the case, in the end, with the Obama administration and Jim, they managed to reinforce their right to try and squeeze us to reveal our sources. Now, there's other ways in which there's a chilling effect in the air. There are individuals and institutions with very deep pockets with unaccountable private power who don't like the way we report. One case in point, a pending trial involving Mother Jones Magazine. Right now, they're facing trial in Idaho Falls with a super rich plaintiff, Frank Vandersloot, who has said basically he doesn't want any money. He's a former campaign co-chairman for Mitt Romney, and he's spending millions of dollars while he bleeds the magazine and ties up its staff, and the story stays below the radar. Again, it's one more example of litigation being used and or the threat of it to tame the press, to cause publishers or broadcasters to decide whether to stand up or stand down to self-censor. And that's the kind of chill that now spread here to this symposium and to the IRP since last year. Last year, we screened two clips from the film we were then finishing for Frontline, called, at that time called The Gods of Gambling. A 90-minute documentary, it showed how in 10 short years, the Chinese gambling mecca of Macau grew to be seven times bigger than Las Vegas making Chinese tycoons and U.S. casino operators like Steve Wynn and Sheldon Adelson super rich. In fact, that's the fortune that allows Sheldon Adelson today to attract all the prospective or most of the respective, prospective Republican nominees to his casino in Las Vegas so he can have his own little primary. The documentary now renamed, has then renamed Bigger Than Vegas, was originally scheduled for air right after the symposium, but Frontline decided to reschedule it for their season premiere on September 30th, 2014. <laughs> they did this despite a series of letters, at least one from Steve Wynn, threatening litigation, but they were unfazed. As we approached that September air date, however, the chill grew. 
it was clear that their confidence in the documentary was shaken. They raised editorial questions, which well they should. And there was that possibility of litigation. Finally, Frontline announced that it was going to postpone the broadcast, announcing that there was, quote, more journalism to do. And then within days of that announcement, there was a shot across our bow. An unprecedented lawsuit, not directed at us directly, but at the screening, and one of the panelists was filed. Now to talk about that, and that, this is one of the reasons that things have changed, to talk about that, I want to bring our renowned attorney, Gary Bostwick, to the stage. As many of you know, he is one of the most experienced and respected defamation lawyers in the country. Gary Bostwick. So it was April last year, in this very room, there were panelists spread out in front of you, and Lowell thinks, and I agree with him, that you deserve, because some of you were here at the beginning uh, of this whole thing. Some of you were here that very day, and among the panelists was Jim Chanos, and the short clip of a yet undone uh, film, Gods of Gambling, was shown for a short amount of time. Uh, Jim Chanos is the founder and the head of Kinikos Associates. Kinikos in Greek means cynicism. I really love that part about it because he has an investment strategy that is very different than somebody like Warren Buffett. He bets that things are going down. He is what is called a short seller. He manages other people's money and he does it largely by short selling. So a lot of people look at him as being kind of like a canary in a coal mine. I mean, if he starts shorting something, everybody begins to wonder whether or not things are going down. He was one of the very, very first ones who noticed that Enron was a house of cards. And he's famous for that. And that was one of the reasons he was here, because he had been long. He had been betting on Macau casinos, and then he decided to go short. But you saw this date up here, it was September 30th when there was supposedly going to be a premiere. And, on, uh, and over the course between April and September, there was a lot of work going on in the, uh, in, on the film, but obviously there was a lot of work going on amongst Steve Wynn's lawyers because on September 25th, he filed a lawsuit against Jim Chanos on his behalf and on behalf of his his uh, company for slander for the very words that were said right here. Now Lowell and I debated whether we should give this talk on Sunday afternoon <clears throat> when no one was here. <laughs> so that none of the panelists in the rest of the program would be scared by what we're saying. But in fact, Jim Chanos was sued for what he said right here and no one else was sued. I was asked to participate on the defense team and I joined it. The suit was filed across the bay in federal court, and Wynn made motion after motion in discovery to find out who you all were. Now, those of you who weren't here, he wasn't trying to find out about you, but those of you who were here, he wanted to know who you were, how to get in touch with you, and what your function was. It was important to him in the lawsuit. The judge didn't buy that argument but he tried four times to get all of your personally identifiable information. <clears throat> um, when it turns out that uh, the judge, William Oreck, um, the son of another federal judge that I started practicing in front of when I was only about 20 years old, I think, uh, looked at it, dismissed it in December, gave them leave to try to amend the complaint, they amended it, and finally dismissed it once again in March, early March. It was dismissed, and there was an entire uh, opinion granting fees to Jim Chanos somewhere around a little above half a million dollars. Um, and that's being fought out at the moment. Wynn has appealed that decision. But 
Lowell thought the responsibility was for you at least to know a little bit about the lawsuit without getting really lawyer geeky here. We're gonna to try to show you a little bit about it. So what a, sh what a, what a chill does is, is in fact, it, it is brought not really to win. It is brought to send a message to somebody, which is, shut up. You can't do what David Logan asked him to do, cause trouble, without having someone react. So lawsuits have been brought for many years to try to quiet people down. In California, we have something called an anti-slap statute. So that's against suits that are brought that are just strategic litigation against public participation. I don't know where they came up with that. Uh, they, but, but, it, but it's famous now all over the country. There are about 30 states that have anti-slap statutes. They can be used in federal court. And, and it is to stop people from primarily chilling peop uh, other people <laughs> and to deter them from filing frivolous lawsuits. That's what that's all about. Now, it doesn't always work, of course. <coughs> here's, here's something that was said, and, and I can tell you this because it's in the court filings. I am quoting from a court filing, right? And what was said was, Chanos is now defended. If you mention the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the same sentence as Wynn Resorts Limited, you get a day in court. Right? So that's evidence outside the lawsuit that there must be something else going on here than trying to win a lawsuit. So when is a lawsuit brought primarily to chill free speech? How do you figure that out? I'm going to let the judge tell you. There's a reason why I'm going to let the judge tell you. I can't get in trouble for letting the judge tell you. Lowell can't get in trouble. You all can't get in trouble. So. Here's what the judge said. The whole point was, this was in an academic symposium, annual symposium for investigative reporting. People were here by invitation only. Well, we think some rogues might have slipped in, we don't know. <laughs> Possibility is those of you without badges, I'm not sure whether you were invited, but the point is, Basically, it's people who are invited. They're all part of a community. They're supposed to be here to listen to what's going on. And this is a university, right? The judge saw that. This is what he said about it. Next. All right, so here's the panel. You can see it looks very much like today, right? <laughs> Next. The panel discussion started with a short clip. It was from the gods of gambling. It was really very short. but. The, the fact is, the judge says they watched the, pan, the, the clips, and then they discussed an upcoming television documentary that focuses on the gambling industry in Macau. After viewing a clip of the documentary, he asks a question. But Mr. Chanos, you're famous, obviously, for shorting Enron. Why are you shorting Macau in China? I know somebody's going to say, the sound is off. There's a reason for it. It's not our sound man. He's doing his job. We don't want Jim Chano saying those words again. We don't want him to get sued again. So I'm going to let the judge tell you what he said. <laughs> You just saw a tangible chilling effect right there. Now this is, Lowell didn't want me to read slides. I don't like them either, but, but the fact is this is important because this is what David McCraw was talking about yesterday about slander by implication, defamation by implication. Look at this. Even I got a little nervous. The deeper we dug into Macau and the more, I got concerned. Janet Malcolm would tell you people, you know, talk like that. You don't write like that, but people talk like this. Right? We dug into Macau, and the more I got concerned that although I was long, the US casino operators, like Mr. Adelson and Mr. Wynn, I began to really get concerned about the risk I was taking with clients' money under the FCPA and a variety of other, you know, 
aspects of exactly how business is done there. And although they hide behind the facade of the junket companies increasingly from a, if not across the legal line, to use my friend Bethany McLean's term, it was legal fraud. While they might be adhering to every aspect of legal requirements in what they were doing, there was still an attempt to mislead, an attempt to obfuscate, and I just couldn't get comfortable with that. I don't know, what do you all think? I was sitting here in the audience. I'm a defamation lawyer. I defend these things all the time. I didn't, I wasn't worried about what he said. I thought it was clear, it was okay, it's fine. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe something could be said about it. But here's what the judge says. Later on in the conversation, Chano stated, I mean, the fact of the matter is that with the FCPA, almost any major company doing business in China that knows something about the law, it's a pretty broad law. Almost any company doing meaningful, meaningful amounts of business probably could be in violation of the FCPA. Is that liable by implication? I don't know for sure. So here's what the judge said. Chanos didn't say when violated the law. He merely addressed his own worries about risk. He has a right to be worried and to, sp and to, and to talk about his worry. From worries to violation is too far to leap. It takes a significant inferential leap to conclude that Chanos's business general uncertainty was an actual assertion that Wynn had violated the law. So, case is dismissed. The problem is, as Lindsay said from the Center for Investigative Reporting, we're all part of an ecosystem. This is only the very center of the amoeba here, but it is an ecosystem, and everybody who, who considers these facts knows that even though the case was dismissed, there still has been a significant amount of chill over the entire ecosystem. And all of you will have to decide for yourself how that chill has, has played out and how it'll play out in the future. But it is something that, in spite of the fact that they lost, of course, they still are on appeal, but in spite of the fact that they've lost at the trial court, they might have won. It's possible. By the way, those of you sitting along the wall there, there are empty seats if you want to, I'll take a minute if you want to grab some seats. Um, didn't want to have a fire hazard here, it was getting a little crowded. Now before I invited Gary up here, I got to the point, I believe, of saying that that it was a couple of days after the filing of the law, before a couple of days before the filing of this lawsuit. Let's be clear: the chronology. Frontline announced that it was going to postpone the broadcast of what was now called Bigger Than Vegas, September 30th. Um, and I should point out that that uh, some, most of you know this, but just for the record, that. We've had a long, fruitful, close relationship with Frontline over many years. When I left CBS in 1998, late 1998, I helped forge their collaborations with the New York Times and later ProPublica. I've written and spoken publicly about David Fanning and Randy Aronson in glowing terms. And in this business, people of goodwill often disagree about issues, important issues, like whether to broadcast something. We were disappointed in that decision to postpone. We were deeply concerned, all of us who worked on it. There was a decision to keep the film in Boston, and they would continue to work on it, but we still hoped that it would air. But you know, when you decide to delay a story, and many of you who are experienced with this know 
particularly a potentially volatile story, the world around you doesn't stop. And so Macau, which was dependent upon what I think we could fairly say was a, um, a business model that required the massive violation of current Chinese currency controls, had already become a focus of the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, and his government's anti-corruption crackdown. And he declared that all public officials in China could no longer travel to Macau because they were gambling the public's money. The open, illicit movement of billions out of China, the centerpiece of the film, became the focus of the crackdown. And many of the junket companies, which Chenos was mentioning, which provided high rollers to casinos and were notorious for their involvement in Chinese organized crime, began to belly up. Casino stocks plunged. And in the first six months, I believe, of 2015, for example, Sheldon Adelson alone lost $10 billion on paper. The story was changing under our feet. After four months, four and a half months of working on the journalism, as they described it, shortly before a tentative air date, Frontline told us on January 22nd that they would not run the story. We strongly regret and re regretted that decision because we're convinced that the story was solid. They disagreed. We decided not to say anything publicly about it, except at first we told Frontline that we had to an obligation to inform those involved in the film, the interview subjects, our staff, the journalism school, our, some of our donors. After all, this had been a two-year effort, and that's what we owed the people who took risks, in some cases, to talk to us. And by the way, the, many publishers and, and individuals would not talk because of the fear of themselves of litigation. And this is what Frontline posted when we told them we were going to do that. They said, we don't normally comment on investigative projects in progress or our editorial decisions, but unfortunately we now decided not to broadcast the film it's a rare and hard decision, what we believe the right one for Frontline. So the documentary, Bigger Than Vegas, was dead, at least on Frontline. We at the investigative reporting program believe that the story was killed for two reasons, their editorial concerns and their concerns about the legal consequences. We also told Frontline at the time that we felt an obligation, to, as Gary outlined it, to talk here about the symposium where it was previewed a year ago. But I caution that I cannot talk today about many aspects of all of this. One, because we hope to actually make most of this public, the information that's in the documentary, and the real ongoing threat of litigation because we've decided that we're gonna to try to get this story out in print and broadcast. After some negotiation, Frontline has agreed to give us access to the footage, but we're still working on the details around that. But to give you an idea of the atmosphere, the chilling atmosphere that exists today, when you have potential deep pocket litigants, and to test the, uh, I had an immediate incident take place. I made, started to make inquiries about who might broadcast this in case we could get all the footage. So I talked to a senior executive at another broadcaster in the PBS system to see what they thought. They knew about the film, it had been promoted and scheduled, and then it, as far as they were concerned, vanished. When I told this executive that it, it wasn't going to run on Frontline, he was surprised and then interested. I explained that there was a high likelihood of litigation and that threats had already been made. A week later, the executive emailed me, quote, you were very straight with me about the huge likelihood of being sued over this film, 
And that's a real disincentive for an organization that neither has neither deep pockets nor a lot of experience as a defendant. And he went on to suggest, quote, you need a deep-pocketed philanthropic backer. <laughs> if there are any present, I'll take you to lunch. <laughs> what does Frontline have to say about what happened? We invited them, as we always do, and usually try to include them in the program. They're not here today, primarily, they said, because Rainey Aronson is getting an award, an alumni award, from the trustees of Columbia's Journalism School. So we've briefed them over the phone and then sent them a draft text of everything we've said here. Um, and they said we should rely on their prior statements and they would post something after my remarks, which you'll be able to find on frontlinediet.org forward slash press room. In the meantime, we're moving forward with a new partner, The Guardian. Story ran Thursday. We believe there will be more to come in the following week because after Sheldon Adelson um, uh, holds court this weekend, uh, he's then in court next week testifying in open court about some of the information that would have been in our film. And that's going to make some news, we believe. And so does a major broadcaster. And we hope with that new broadcasting partner, that we will be able to cover this unfolding story related to the film and related to the area that we were reporting on. Now, we've learned a number of hard lessons from this. One, we've decided that we're going to change our sort of model. In the past, we've contracted with people like Frontline, and they wind up owning the film because they pay for it, and they have last cut. We need more control over our work. We need an ownership interest. So we've dedicated ourselves to try and creating a new business model, new relationships with partners in print and broadcasting where we have more editorial control and potentially some revenue. And we've been encouraged because there has been a change in the economics of in-depth reporting and journalism over the last couple of years. The economics of nonfiction journalism have changed. The marketplace, there is a growing marketplace for nonfiction documentaries. And we intend to dive into that. We see it as a way of helping making the IRP self-sustaining, and we're told that given our track record, and by the way, the university in preliminary discussions has encouraged us to go forward with this and will in fact, at least preliminarily, give us their name to use in the attempt to raise capital. Um, we intend to ride this wave so that in the future, with the help obviously of the new technologies, digital technology, we hope to reach a wider audience and diminish concerns about self-censorship. So, what all this reminded me of while we were going through it is that, you know, I've been around a long time. I was around back in the 60s and 70s when publishers and broadcasters and reporters went to the mat. That's how a lot of our rights got created. And I think that we need to take an assessment of where we are and where we're going and be willing, in fact, to go to battle when it's necessary. So the only way we've been able to survive doing that, and I want to make sure that everyone understands that when Gary just got up here, was, uh, is that we have been able here at the IRP to uh, gather together and have the support of a unique group of pro bono attorneys who have actually stood up and done things that we could never have afforded. 
representing us and making it possible for us to do this work. And I'd like to give them all, there's a bunch of them here today, a round of applause. Now, as part of our new commercial venture, I have here postcards <laughs> announcing the airing of Bigger Than Vegas on September 30th. Um, if anyone's interested in having one, you can have one. But if you want my signature, it's going to cost you money. <laughs>